Today we'll be discussing the new TV show Hacks and comedians writing jokes for other comedians. And we'll be discussing ADHD in children. This is Doctor versus Comedian. Dr. Asif Doja, and this is the Doctor of Laughs. Not a real doctor. Ali Hassan. Every episode, I pick a topic for Ali from comedy and entertainment, and I question him about it. Then Ali picks a topic for medicine and health and grills me on that topic. Today, we'll be discussing the new cable TV show Hacks and comedians writing jokes for other comedians. And we'll be discussing ADHD in children and whether we're overdiagnosing it. But first, Ali. You're actually visiting us from a different Foreign location. <laughs> now, nobody knows. Everybody thinks it sounds like we're in the same room and we record this. We don't. That's a I guess. Strong. Well, I think it's valuable to bring it up also because uh, a couple of reasons. Number one, my sound might be different from what mm -hmm. uh, my little uh, home crafted studio that I'm usually in. So this might sound a little different. But also, it might sound different because I'm in a hotel in St. John's, Newfoundland right now. Do tell. Do, do tell. tell. Do tell. Well, Right now, St. John's hasn't fully opened up, so it's in a you know, semi-lockdown state. So what young people do is they come to this hotel. They book a room in this hotel on the weekend, and they use the pool and the water slide, and they get room <laughs> service, and they have the time of their life. And I mention that because you will definitely, during this podcast, hear screaming children running down the hallway. And I don't want people to be like, does that guy have his... Children in a dungeon somewhere? I don't. That is gleeful screaming and yelling, and it's children heading uh, to and from the pool. It's happened three times this morning already. <laughs> okay. Guaranteed it'll happen in this hour, so I have to mention that. But otherwise, yeah, happy for the little bit of a change of scenery here. So maybe we should explain. So in Canada right now, most provinces are, are locked down, so you can't go in and out of uh, oh, yeah. Our American listeners, this is a long forgotten memory yeah. potentially, right? Yeah, right. Right exactly. In the mainland United States, you could travel. My sister was just in Hawaii where it's a bit more strict. There's testing when you go in and things like that and when you're leaving. So, but mainland United States, pretty free to travel between states, but in Canada, it's more restrictive. What the Atlantic provinces did, so Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, PEI, New Brunswick, they had what's called an Atlantic bubble for a while and now they're easing up on travel within that bubble. But the question is why are you somebody who's not from Newfoundland allowed into the province? Why did so they let my tell. filthy butt into the bubble? Well, I'm uh, I'm on a show. I'm on an episode of a show called Hudson and Rex and that show is as it sounds, man named Hudson, dog named Rex, mm -hmm. together find themselves in um, a precarious and life-threatening situations all the time. I will be on uh, an episode of that show for next season. Is it like a cop, like a cop and a, and a police dog? Exactly right. That's not self-explanatory. <laughs> well, I mean, you could get, we, we all know who live, who grew up in Canada, Littlest Hobo. He got into some very life-threatening situations. Littlest Hobo was a German shepherd, for those of you who don't know, and he would have different uh, yeah. adventures every week. He'd just Rex come upon a, a new shepherd. group of people and have an adventure, then <laughs> take off. <laughs> Um, stray dog walking down, you know. Uh, he, did you see the episode where he got rabies, by the way? That was a really no, I didn't. sad. I'm just I joking. Didn't see that. But, but listen, so, and what's the relation between, uh, what is it, Rex and who is it? Hudson and Rex. Hudson Rex is a classic dog's name. So I that's understand. why I thought this would be, yeah. No, uh, but I, just, I, just forgot, I forgot Hudson's name. But what about <laughs> the, uh, what about, their relationship between Tur <laughs> between them and Turner and Hooch. Like, what's the – are they cousins? It's a rivalry. Them? It's a rivalry. It's a friendly rivalry. <laughs> you know, they'll write each other, but it'll always be very formal. They're not too friendly. Okay. Can you tell us who you like, who you play or what your character is? is well, allowed? the chief of police is a guy named Donovan, not Hudson. And his, no, don't widen your eyes. Asif widened his eyes. He thought I'd made it. I'd made it to yeah, police. Yeah, I thought you were the chief of police. No, oh my that's gosh. Not a, that's not a guess oh, role. I am the, uh, I'm the childhood buddy of the chief of police. We're treasure hunting and uh, somebody, somebody dies and I'm one of the suspects all of a sudden. So the chief of police, oh, no. yikes, one has of his closest buddies has to oh, investigate no. his own friend. Yeah. Wow. That's Did I do exciting. it? You stay tuned and find and, out. And, you know, I know, you know, we've talked about this a lot and I, I am just legitimately curious. Is the fact that you're 
not white and how Muslim. Does that play you? anything? How into, dare you, did you bring know? that up and throw it in my face at a time like this? Did you know that you weren't? I don't know. Uh, if well, you... Donovan himself is a black man. I think this this okay. production does uh, does a great job of doing some okay. some pretty diverse so, casting. Yeah, but 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 again, it's not inherent to your character. That it is you're, not. My yeah, name is which Reggie. is great. My name Great. is oh, Reggie. Oh, nice. Yeah. Just like, uh, and and do, for Reggie, does do Archie and Veronica and Jughead show up later? Or? Mm. So, Ali, I wanted to ask you about this new show that's uh, on TV. It's on, in the States, HBO Max. In Canada, you can get it on Crave. I heard about it through a TV critic who I read a lot, which is Alan Seppenwall. He writes for Rolling Stone. He's been associated with different publications over time, but now he's with Rolling Stone. Great TV critic. And it's funny, you know, these critics that I like, it's because they write something. I'm like, yeah, exactly. I think exactly the way you do. Which, But in one respect, that's good because then when he's writing something about the show Hacks – that I, I'm into it. And he was actually writing about the season finale. And I'm like, what? The season? I never even heard of this show. Mm. So it came out in May, and I'm all, we're only catching up with it now, several months later. And so he was writing about the season finale. So I said, I should check out this show. What's it all about? So the premise of the show is Gene Smart, who plays a washed up kind of, not washed up, but a, an aging comedian. Hey, if that's washed up, sign me up. Yeah, buddy. she's not really washed up. I shouldn't have said that. She's not washed up. She's at the tail end of her career, actually. She's at the tail end, but she's, she's, yeah. she's opulently wealthy. She's made yeah. a, a massive amount of, of money. And you mentioned this to me, Asif, that uh, this is clearly a Joan Rivers a tribute at the right. very at the very so least. yeah so she she and because she's doing a Las Vegas comedy show every night or five nights a week or something like yeah. that she's headlining at a casino in their big theater but she is at the tail end of her career so it reminds me of Joan Rivers towards the end and what happens is she's kind of like you know the casino wants to bring in other younger hipper acts. So the character played by Jean Smart is kind of like, you know, how can I stay relevant? And her manager, it's weird though. It's a manager, but I think he acts more like an agent, but what mm -hmm. do I know about Hollywood and show business? So the manager also has a writer named Ava, who's played by Hannah Einbinder. I think is how you say her name. And she's kind of this entitled writer, comedy writer, you know, the next big thing who for various reasons get blacklisted by the entertainment world because of a, a tweet that she she writes and then so she can't get a job. So the manager's idea is to combine these two people and see if they can help each other. That's kind of the premise. So it's kind of like this odd couple relationship between these people. Ava ends up trying to write material for Deborah, Deborah Vance, Vance yeah. Gene Spartan's character. My thanks to uh, your buddy Seppenwall for recommending this to you and for you uh, to have recommended this to me. I really, I've only watched the pilot, but as soon as I possibly can, in other words, today, after I get my first COVID test in Newfoundland, I'm coming back and I'm, I'm watching more episodes. I really enjoyed it. And, and I enjoyed it despite the fact that both the characters are pretty unappealing. They're, Ava, this young writer, embodies the worst of Los Angeles in one human being. And Deborah Vance embodies the worst of a rich person. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, was, I was like, this is supremely watchable somehow. Partly because of that Joan Rivers tribute to, right. you know, they have Deborah Vance, you know, she's on QVC. So she's on the shopping channel, to which mm -hmm. Joan Rivers was. Mm -hmm. They have pictures on her wall at home where she's on Leno. And um, well, you'll see in a, in a later episode, in fact, they talk about she almost became the permanent late night host that's actually part of deborah vance's character i'm not trying to spoil anything for people yes and that f fell through for reasons which you'll see in the in sure, the pilot sure. uh, and in the second episode wh why that happened and so it's clearly i mean she has kind of edgy humor i wouldn't say blue but kind of edgy humor and when you think about who this would be in real life there's actually only one person i could think of is joan rivers there are other older comics but nobody quite in the age range of this person right maybe a phyllis diller or something like that but phyllis diller would probably be a bit older than this age range and of course joan rivers has passed away so it, it, it's kind of extrapolating maybe what would happen to joan rivers if she didn't pass away several years ago i love joan rivers i think she was hilarious she was so fearless in her comedy 
And I think that's why she got into trouble, you know, with Carson sometimes and with um, some of her jokes. But she, you know, didn't shy away from it. And that's what you kind of want in a comedian. Yeah, not one of my favorites, as it as it turns out. Just as a person, I, I, didn't, I didn't find her very likable. But I give her a tremendous amount of respect for her work ethic, which was tireless to the point of almost mania. And also her fearlessness. I mean, what she did, she was a pioneer. She was an absolutely groundbreaking mm-hmm. performer and what she was able to do. And her roots, you know, who she was and where she came from to what she made of herself. It's it's very, very impressive. I'll never cease to be impressed by her journey as a performer. And I encourage people, if they don't know enough about Joan Rivers, she deserves some respect for what she did for female performers and for the field of comedy in general. And I, I think, you know, there is a documentary And I'll tell you, it was actually influential in my life. It's called A Piece of Work. A Piece of Work, yeah, yeah, exactly. And that documentary, when I saw that in, I think it was 2014 or 2015, I mean, this woman has a team, okay? So she has an actual team. There's like two accountants, there's two managers, there's an agent, there's every, all these people who surround her influenced me. That I watched it later after it had come out uh, already a few years I had an agent who really wasn't doing very much for me and unfortunately had her own personal problems going on. And I, one of the more cold things I've done, but everybody encouraged me like, no, no, you have to go with somebody who is hungry and aggressive and ready to do things for you. And if they have personal problems that are keeping them from doing their job, as cold as it sounds, that's not your Mm -hmm. problem. So I Mm -hmm. felt very bad about that because this was an agent who had believed in me for a long time. But after watching Joan River special, I let my agent go, got a new agent who I've been with ever since. Uh, I got a new accountant. Mm -hmm. Maybe the doorman at the comedy club shouldn't be doing my accounting. You know what I mean? Like I made some actual changes and I surrounded myself with this team and I have great steps in the right direction. So thank you, Joan Rivers. Your, Your legend lives on in my life. She gets a bit of a bad rap because of all the other things associated with, you know, Melissa Rivers, Joan Rivers, they were like on TV a lot, tabloids a lot, you know, all the plastic surgery she had done. Yeah, this show doesn't go in that direction, at least not from what I've seen. Yeah, no, for sure. And what I liked about her is even the plastic surgery stuff, she would make fun of herself for it. You know what I mean? She didn't deny it. She Mm. didn't hide behind it like so many people in in Hollywood do. She died in uh, 2014, I believe from uh, cardiac arrest during a medical procedure, not not yes. a um, plastic surgery procedure. And so, and she was 81. Like I said, I think she's, she's a bit of a legend. I don't know if she, I don't think so, but in terms of people writing other jokes, right? W- jokes for her, which is what the premise of the show is, right? You're getting a younger person. So we don't have any evidence that that happened with Joan Rivers. I don't know if that did or not, or if it was mentioned in her documentary, but that's certainly the plot of this show mm-hmm. is a younger comic writing for an older comic. So, do you know of any comics who write for other people? Well, I saw the movie Funny People with Adam Sandler and Seth right. Rogen. And in that, <laughs> um, you know, I actually don't. And I I know it exists. It is definitely a thing. It is not overly, you know, widespread. I understand it. I respect it in the sense that, you know, some of these a younger comic who works every other weekend and does open mics and stuff, they can they can judge it and they can say like, oh, I would never have somebody write for me. And that's fine. But you don't have the schedule of a Joan Rivers or let's say a Russell Peters, for example, or any one of these touring headlining giants who do arenas across the world, massive theaters and arenas. When do you have time to stop and write? You really don't. Russell Peters, I bring it up because he's also one of his sort of hacks, quote unquote, pun intended, because the name of the show is hack. One of his hacks, life hack, although it's it's not really a hack because it's his natural skill, is crowd work. Mm-hmm. So what he can do is he can do 30 minutes or more of crowd work in a one hour show, thereby lessening the quote unquote burden of joke writing because you're just doing stuff in the moment. Sometimes in the moment, something is like, you know what, what just happened in the moment, I'm going to turn that into a joke and I'm going to use that as a new joke. And sometimes you can travel and in your travels, you can be like, this is what I saw, this city. Not everyone can do that. Some people really go city to city with their act, 
right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, how are you Fort Lauderdale? How are you Duluth? How are you Santa Fe? And then they just go into their act. That's what people, not, not every comic has to do 10 minutes on the city they're in. For me, that's incredibly important. That has always been, you know, when I used to go to the comedy works in Montreal and sit and watch these performers, even if they did some hacky joke, even if it was something like, hey, nice to be in Montreal. You know that uh, that Olympic Stadium of yours? Uh, gosh, when that thing's finished, it is going to be something special. And that that was a joke because the Olympic Stadium had like a, it was a, a large toilet bowl effectively. Right, a, right. You know, it it was room. completed, right? That was the joke. It was completed in 1967. It was a, completed in 1967, but it looked incomplete. Hacky joke. Many comedians have done it before. Or variations of it, but just the fact that these comedians would, you know, take a second to talk about the city that they're visiting, it always impressed me, and I always enjoyed it. So for me, that's that's a thing I always like to do: talk about the city I'm in, and that's why to me it's important to get there a little bit beforehand, walk around the city, embrace it. Anyway, not everybody does it, and if you're touring and night after night, day after day, you're waking up in a new city. Where's the joke writing time, right? And then mm -hmm, as soon as mm -hmm, the joke writing mm -hmm. time's done, you're on a television show. Now you now your schedule is again a crazy show because you have to cram in all these this other work when you're not touring. So all that to say, it is actually necessary for some people if they want to build an hour of comedy. You know, I was I was shocked a number of years ago. There was this panel, if you remember, Louis C.K., Ricky Gervais, Jerry Seinfeld. Chris, Chris Rock, Rock yeah. and everyone was like, "What is Ricky Gervais doing on that thing?" Well, I think Ricky Gervais kind of was the one who got all those people together yes. for that. Uh, yeah, and let's also remind everybody: Louis C.K. total jerk, absolutely, loser, absolutely. And that jerk, we found out there. They said it publicly. Chris Rock, I think, is the one who said, it. "Yeah, Louis was writing jokes for me." I was like, "What?" First of all. This white dude is writing jokes for Chris Rock. That's mm -hmm, weird. Mm -hmm, but second of mm -hmm. all, somebody has to write for Chris Rock. And I remember this was, you know, whatever it was, six, seven years ago now. I was pretty stunned. But over time, you come to terms with these things. They just don't have the time for jokes. I think where you're going also is asking me about if I've ever had anybody write for me, and I have not. Hmm. It's been offered twice. And I don't know, it feels weird. God willing. My career will be doing very well. It'll be going just fine if I'm ever able to say, yeah, I need that. I need some mm -hmm. some jokes written for me. The times I've seen it on TV, I just think of examples. It's usually there's comedy writers who write for so special, so the Oscars, right? Yeah. And then when they have the banter and the jokes and the monologue by whoever the host is, the host isn't coming up with that material. Maybe if it was like, I was going to say if it when it was Ellen DeGeneres or David Letterman, but that, that's not true either. I mean, Letterman has writers who write like on the show and every night the monologue for him, for Kimmel, for St Stephen Colbert, for Jimmy Fallon, Trevor all Noah, those guys have yes. their own writers. Like, even though it sounds like they're coming up with their own thing, clearly they have writers doing it. But at the Oscars, like Bruce Valanche is like was like the classic guy. Remember, he was like in the probably the bottom corner on Hollywood Squares, and we're like, uh -huh. who is this Bruce Valanche with the <laughs> crazy hair? But he was like a well known writer, right? Yeah, and yeah. he was like the comedy writer for the Oscars, and always going to him for the funny quips and things. And he, I thought he was a legitimately funny funny person. I bet. And uh, the roasts, like that we talked about on a previous episode about roasts, certainly there are comedians who are on roasts who come up with their own material for sure. But I'm sorry, there is no way that Justin Bieber and Bruce Willis, and all these guys are coming up with their own jokes. Certainly, they may come up with some jokes, but I can almost guarantee you that 100% of their jokes are not fully formed from their own mind. Sure. I used to be on this panel, George Strombolopoulos tonight, this comedy panel. We had a writing room that would write because there was a third chair that was a rotating chair of guests. Mm -hmm. I was a lead. The middle chair was one of maybe three people who were always there. And then the third chair was guests, and they would write for that guest. And sometimes a guest would come in and refuse all the jokes. Mm -hmm. But the team still had to do all that writing. And sometimes a guest would come in with absolutely nothing and take all those jokes. And if they didn't land, they kind of blamed the team a little bit. But it's like, but you also came in with nothing. Like we can't, you know, whip mm -hmm. up a miracle. But normally would they try and do a hybrid? Like, oh, I have some of my own jokes and they write for you. And then, or is that not, like, it was more one or the other extreme? 
Sometimes there was a hybrid and sometimes it was extremes. There's some comedians that have such an original voice that mm -hmm. it's just difficult to write for them. But those people also were often ready with tons of stuff themselves mm -hmm. in the writing mm -hmm. room. Like mm -hmm. I thought maybe I'd say this and they'd be, we'd all be like, well, no one can make that sound better than you just did. And that's from your own voice, from your own mind. So that, mm -hmm. that's usually what works best. But, you know, you have to lean on writers sometimes. There's no doubt about it. And it's no different from the music industry, right? There was some huge, I don't know even why that was a big discussion about Drake has a ghost writer and like, yeah, most musicians have other people right. writing their stuff and then they go away and disappear into the shadows with a nice paycheck and a contract signed saying that they will never have any rights to this music or ever admit that they wrote it. But that's a whole thing. That's a whole thing. Yeah, and I, I mean, yeah, I, there's obviously different levels because the really famous writers and producers obviously get credit. People go to them for their material, right? Sure. Like, sure. You know. But yeah, that's a good point. I, I thought about that as well because comedians, as we've talked about, always have to come up with new material, new material. You can't be like the Eagles and just play the greatest hits, right? Mm. And that's all people want to hear. They don't want to hear the new material for, for musicians, but it's the opposite, right? So, you can see why people, especially if they're getting towards the end of their career, they have to actually try to come up with something maybe newer, edgier, things like that. It takes me back to this character, right? Deborah Vance in Hacks. And like, I know that Bob Hope used to have a, a series of writers, but then, you know, is it diminishing returns for these comedians as they're getting to the end of their career, right? Because again, comedians have to come up with new material. They can't just rely on the old jokes. Mm. But then, you know, is your new material going to be hip when you're in your 70s or even 80s, you know? But then how artificial is it for a 70 or 80 year old comedian to be, oh, the other day on Snapchat, you know, yeah, and, or, or do thing. you make a joke about how you don't understand Snapchat? But then young people are like, yeah, because you're stupid and 75 old. You know? years I don't old, know. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting. And, you know, my, I always bring up my buddy Ron Jossel's joke at this point. He always talks about like the problem with comedians and comedy is that audience members are like, I already heard that one, which is you're never going to, if Madonna did a worldwide <laughs> tour, no one's sitting there going, ugh, like a virgin, seriously, again, ugh, mm -hmm. like it's, they mm -hmm. only want the greatest hits with mm -hmm. comedians. Come on, you're a writing machine, write another one. It takes time. It takes so much time to write and craft and hone and practice. And once you get one, you're not really keen to throw it out. You're like, let me mm -hmm. milk this. Let me milk this. Mm -hmm. Let me, for these mega stars, it's like, let me make sure I get this joke on television, mm -hmm. right? At the very least. And then I'll decide whether I keep performing it or not. But yeah, sometimes it means you hear like, you see somebody elbow and they go, look, look this is what, I love this joke. I love this bit. Mm -hmm. But if you're still doing the same thing, you know, years, years later, you know, I remember I had this opening joke and I was like worried, like I keep doing the same opener. And I remember somebody telling me, you know, Ray Romano had the same opener for like 12 years. You have an opening joke, it's, it works. It, the opening joke does a bunch of things at once. It introduces you to an audience. It makes them laugh immediately. It wins them on your side. It sets your tone. These are mm -hmm. like an important tone, thing. Yeah. Now you got to work to find a new one. Like, I don't think people fully realize that, but yeah. And it's an interesting thing because these writers, Typically, if you have a good writer, like it's a, it's a partnership, right? Like you think of like uh, Will Ferrell and Adam McKay, for example, like that's a partnership. They're not going to bring some 18, 20 year old into that room if they're writing and creating. Now, this is, you know, I'm talking about comedy in general, not just stand up. So what happens is now you have your buddy who's probably also 75 years old writing jokes for you, but where mm -hmm, are they? Mm -hmm. And, and it's true. Like, do you really want? to have an 80 year old talking about TikTok. Like I stay off of TikTok out of respect for my daughters. Like I am like, I remember when my mother got on Facebook, I was like, oh God, you're ruining it. What are you doing? I don't want to be, you know, I forced them off of TikTok. I'm like, you know, I'll watch it, but I don't want to have a, try to have this weak presence on TikTok in a world that I don't understand as well. So yeah, it's a very interesting predicament. And I think, you know, when you are 70s plus, most of your fans are that age also. So, yeah, it's mostly doing jokes about, I don't understand what the kids are yeah. doing with this stuff and that yeah. stuff. 
and as you said, sometimes it's the style and you can't, can you write in that comedian style? So I don't know anything about Bob Newhart in terms of if he has writers or not, hmm. but Bob Newhart's comedy is such a specific style, especially his, his, the phone calls, right? Yeah. Like the phone yeah. call, the one sided conversation, you're only hearing your side. I mean, it's, Nobody does it better. Nobody does that better than Bob Newhart. I'm sorry, but he's the best. Mm. But that's a very specific way he writes and the way he pauses and the way he tells the jokes and the way you're hearing his side of the conversation, not the other one. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe he is writers, but I, that's a person who is getting up there. He's 91 now, mm. but who it seems like it would be hard to write for that kind of style to right. get his exact voice. That's interesting. I mean, I think they could punch up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. After that one pause, you say this, maybe you could say this, and he could be, oh, yeah, I like that, right? But his entire style, it would be difficult. Whereas Don Rickles, mm -hmm. you know, recently departed, but best friend of Bob Newhart's, was a much more, you know, rat a tat tat roast comic style that's yeah, very easy insult, to write for. insult, insult comic, yeah. And you can see I can write a joke in a Don Rickles style, right? right Whereas right. you could also try and write a joke in a Bob Newhart style, but I don't know how good you'd be in terms of doing that. Yeah. Yeah, he's the master. At the beginning, you were talking about some of your thoughts on the show Hacks, which kind of prompted this whole conversation. It's interesting. One thing Alan Sepinwall says is it has what's called the Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip problem. So mm -hmm. this is an interesting thing. So he kind of coined this phrase, but it's something that people, writers, TV writers have talked about. There was this show by Aaron Sorkin called Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip. Do you remember this show? I do. I remember Matthew Perry. Was I Correct me if I'm wrong. Was it kind of competition for 30 Rock? Was it supposed to be? It's So, yeah, exactly. They came out the same year, and Studio 60 was the big show. I think they were both on NBC, and Studio 60 was the big promoted show. Yeah, this is the hot new Aaron Sorkin show, because Sorkin was just coming off the West Wing. So this was his follow-up, mm. uh, major follow-up to the West Wing. And so this was like, the, yeah, this is this is it. This is the big show. Nate Cordry was in it, Rob Cordry's brother, Matthew Perry, etc. So there was a bunch of people in it. And then there was also this small startup show from Tina Fey, mm. fresh off leaving SNL, which was 30 Rock. And 30 Rock was the behind the scenes of a sketch comedy show yeah. similar to SNL. Studio 60 was the behind the scenes of a sketch comedy show similar to SNL. So both these things coming out at the same time. And they were on the same network? Yeah, they were on the same network. If you can believe it, it's just so crazy that that happened starting in, I think, 2006. It's, it, they both came on. So – one of them was funny and really good, and that mm. was 30 Rock, and that's the one we remember over time. And Studio yeah. 60, I don't know if it was one season or two, but it was canceled. And one of the issues with that show is what Seppenwall is talking about. It's very hard to write sketch comedy. It's even harder to write sketch comedy for a show that is supposed to be about sketch comedy. Mm -hmm. Because – in Studio 60, what it was is like there was these brilliant writers. It's all about writing, you know, because Sorkin's a writer, so he wanted to have writing be the prominent. Whereas the writers in 30 Rock were a bunch of goofball, uh, hilarious losers, right? Yeah, so yeah. already they're already making a difference. And when they would have Tracy Morgan lose his place on the show and things like that in 30 Rock, it was part of the show, right? It was part mm. of the, the comedy. But Studio 60, they're like, look how funny these writers are. And they show you a sketch and you're like, this is brutal. Like, it's not funny. It's what you think is funny, but it's certainly not. And that would keep happening throughout the show. Mm. So, Sepinwall's point is it's very hard to write funny comedy in a TV show or something like that, right? Especially if it's a performer, like a stand-up or a sketch or things like yeah. that. Yeah, I agree with that. I think when it's put on – it never has that same live feel. And I think a better thing to do in any environment where you have a stand-up comic, any televised show environment, the best thing is to have an actual stand-up doing actual stand-up comedy for, you know, and that's why I think Pete Holmes' show, Crashing, worked so well because mm -hmm. these were all comics. They were in the cellar in New York. Mm -hmm. They were just doing their bits for audiences where, you know, it wasn't like... I don't, maybe it was, or maybe it was, but it wasn't SAG after actors, you know, like a unionized actors. If they were actors in the audience, they were still getting actual stand up comedy and laughing legitimately at it. And same thing with Funny People. You mentioned Funny People by Judd Apatow. Same thing, right? He used real comics in it. He also had Seth Rogen as well. 
you had a decent sorry and some of these other comics in it in supporting roles, right? To to make it more authentic. So that's the that's the trick. It becomes harder with sketch comedy, obviously, but that would that would be the trick. And so uh, they don't do that in um, hacks. Hacks, yeah. In other words, this is original material kind of written for uh, Deborah Vance's character. And then there are some jokes that uh, Ava, the the kind of young writer, gives to her. And some of them are funny, some of them aren't. I, there is a bit of a – they're able to get away with it slightly, I think, because I think some of the jokes that Deborah Vance says, especially at the beginning, like in the pilot episode, are supposed to be kind of like – not hacky jokes, but kind of like maybe a bit worn jokes. You know what I mean? Like Yeah, they're... they are well worn. And she says that too to Ava. She makes a reference. No jokes about pantyhose or dead husbands or something. I've yeah. done them all. I can't yeah, remember yeah. what that second is, but she goes, I've done them all. So thereby sort of admitting that I have taken a premise oh, and beat it to absolute. I remember. Death. Do you remember what it was? No, no. jokes about pantyhose or the Challenger explosion. That was oh, yeah, the Challenger <laughs> Which is a hilarious which, line. Which is a hilarious line. I mean, how do you get hackier than the challenger in, <laughs> yeah. in 2021, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, and, uh, but both of those jokes also date her, right? And that yeah. was, that's why that line is so funny in the show. And so, yeah, I, I think part of it is part of the show. Now that you'll see as you get along, I'm a few episodes ahead of you. So you'll see as you get along, there are some points where like Ava, the writer character is like laughing at watching some old stand up from Deborah Vance. And you're like, yeah, mm. I'm not quite sure that's that funny, but the point is there. Some of their banter back and forth is actually quite hilarious mm. as they're kind of insulting each other or things like that. And it's, it's the typical like odd couple, you know, kind of getting together. And as you said, one thing I like about it is these characters should be totally unlikable, but yet I like them both. And I want mm. to see what happens in the show. Ava's character is the actress, Hannah Einbinder. She reminds me of Ellie Kemper, but like a, a uh, um, tortured Ellie Kemper, you know, that type of uh, – sure. uh, and, uh, and listen, Jean Smart, uh, you know, it's just so funny how – what a career she's had as she's gotten older. You know, she – really most people remember her from Designing Women yeah. right back, back in the day. But then she was on 24. She was the wife of the president of 24. She was excellent mm-hmm. in that. She was a couple of seasons on 24. So that's when I kind of saw her again. And then she basically appeared in a bunch of shows uh, that I loved. The first season of Legion, which was this um, show on FX, which was a um, uh, X-Men kind of spinoff. Mm-hmm. Very well done. The first season's amazing. The subsequent seasons were not good. And I stopped watching it. But the first season was amazing. And Gene Smart played the mother of the, of the main character. Most recently, she was in Watchmen, the miniseries Watchmen, which was on HBO. And that was amazing. She played the Silk Spectre in that. She was absolutely amazing. And then, most recently, she was in Mayor of Easttown. I don't know if you saw Mayor of Easttown. No, but it is all the rage. I mean, at least who I follow on Twitter can't get enough. That show is so well done. And again, like she just proves – and she's a relatively minor character in it. But again, very different than her character in Watchmen and very different than the character of Deborah Rand. So you you can tell that – writers in Hollywood and directors are watching Jean Smart. They're like, I need her in my next show. I need her yeah. in my next show. And she's doing a great job. I thought she was excellent in the show. Phenomenal. Absolutely great. Absolutely great. And it, yeah, I think it's a testament to both these actors, Hannah, who plays Ava, and Jean Smart, who plays Deborah, are supremely unlikable and yet supremely watchable. And that's a balance not everyone can achieve easily because – it's it's too like unlikable for too long. You're changing. You're you've got millions of options and you're out. But it, you know mm-hmm. it says something that both of us yeah, were stuck. And there on. there are shows that I stopped watching for unlike like I know a lot of people love Eastbound and Down and other shows of that kind of genre. But mm. when the character is so unlikable and the thing when you have unlikable characters is I think. I don't like it when the supporting characters just tolerate the unlikable character, right? right? right, right and right, don't right. call them out on their stuff. But this is the whole thing. It's two people calling each other out on being a difficult person. Yeah. And that's why it works because, yeah, think nobody's right. putting up their BS. But yeah. in other shows where people are just kind of, oh, shrugging their shoulders, it's like, I don't like that in real life. And I definitely don't like that on a TV show. And it makes me want to turn off. But this show does not do that. But overall, I think that everybody who thinks they might like the show, definitely check it out. It's definitely worth uh, watching. Would you agree? I would. I would definitely. And if you want to hire a writer for your comedic pursuits, don't hesitate to do that. It is done and it is acceptable. (music) 
All right, Asif, I want to ask you about ADD. And I, you mentioned off the top ADHD, and you made that distinction. For me, layperson, mm-hmm. ADD feels like the umbrella term, and ADHD came on as a, a subset of it. I'm sure that's incorrect. So let's start by asking you, what is the difference between ADD and ADHD? Right. Yeah, and I get this question almost every day when we're talking about ADHD. And just so people know, I don't diagnose it or treat it. But because I see a lot of neurologic problems, you can have both, right? I see patients with epilepsy. Often they have ADHD. I see patients with tics and Tourette syndrome. They often have ADHD. So we see it a lot. And I'm able to like counsel patients about it. And, and sometimes they'll say, oh, so your, your, your child, it says here on their chart that they have ADHD. They're like, no, no, it's ADD. For anyone who doesn't know, I know we have I mean, attention deficit disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity, hyperactivity disorder. disorder right? right. So, but they're actually all the same thing. And so I'll explain to you how it's kind of diagnosed. So basically you have- Wait, wait, wait. Um, all the same thing, meaning there is no difference effectively between the two? There's no, difference. There's no oh. difference. There's no difference. Yeah, exactly. So oh. I know. That's why I'm like, it doesn't matter. And like where you're making a distinction where there really doesn't need to be oh. any. So basically ADHD- is the umbrella term, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But you do not have to have all of those features in it, okay? So there's different subtypes. The subtypes would be an inattentive subtype, okay, where you just have inattention. So, Or you can have the impulsivity slash hyperactivity subtype. Or you can have a combined subtype where you have all those things. And that's how we differentiate. But the umbrella term is ADHD in medicine. And and you can have different subtypes of it. So some people don't like that because they're like, no, my child just has inattention. They don't have hyperactivity. So don't include that in there. But mm. that, that's making like distinctions where you don't really have to. But that's basically it. That's the definition of it is you have inattention and or hyperactivity impulsivity. Which you and may or may not have. Right, exactly. And so it occurs in quite a few kids, 3 to 10% of all children will have a diagnosis of ADHD. This is the real question, once you've sort of given the definition of what it is, the, the real question I think that many people would want to ask is, is this new? Or has it always been around and we just right. didn't know okay. about it? These are the things we, you know, as, as non-medical people, we're always wondering. Yeah, so very good question. So let's, let's get into that in a, in a second. So hyperactive and and impulsivity like that can sometimes just be normal we've all had toddlers right those of us who've had kids when they're two or three years old they're running around like crazy they're not staying on one task they're moving around but sometimes that can be age appropriate so is it age appropriate is it not towards the end we'll get into how adhd can be overdiagnosed, right Mm -hmm. so adhd usually we say you can't diagnose it until you're at school age about four or five years old because one of the keys for diagnosing it is it has to occur in more than one situation so for example sometimes you hear parents saying oh my kid's crazy they're running around at home they're uh, throwing things they're impulsive and blah 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 and then they go get to school they're totally fine they sit Mm -hmm. there pay attention there's no issues that's maybe not ADHD. That may be a behavior issue specific to your home, you know, or vice versa, right? They're misbehaving at school and then at home, there's no issues like that. So it needs to occur in more than one environment. That's what we say around four or five is really when you can diagnose it because you need to have those two different environments. The other thing is that it needs to interfere with your functioning. And a lot of mental health disorders that's one of the criteria. It needs to interfere with your functioning. And why is that? Well, all of us can feel down sometimes. All of us can feel anxious sometimes. All of us have ADHD to a certain extent, right? How often are you, for me, I'm in a lecture. Maybe you're watching a movie. Maybe you're listening to me drone on and you're thinking about other things, right? That's normal, you know? It's whether you can shift your focus back to what's going on or you start daydreaming and then your mind is somewhere else, right? And you don't even pay attention to what I'm saying because you're thinking about your taxes or where you're going to go out to get fish and chips in Newfoundland, right? So, uh, Mm -hmm. you kind of flipped it. I am doing my taxes, but dreaming about where I'm going to eat (laughs) fish and chips in Newfoundland. Yeah. I'm never dreaming about my taxes. I'm never thinking about my taxes. You got the wrong guy, but yeah, no, absolutely. I understand. And so it's where they interfere with functioning. So 
There's a colleague of mine who I will not name, but anybody who works with me knows who I'm talking about, who is a brilliant scientist. He's one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. He <laughs> Let clearly, me not name him after I give him the best compliment imaginable. Okay, all know. right. It, it, well, it's because of what I'm going to say. I don't know for sure, but my opinion is he clearly has ADHD. He's all over the place. He's also one of the funniest people I've met in my life because his mind works so quickly, but it's always working on a multiple different things. But despite that, or, you know, again, I'm just assuming he has ADHD. I, he's never told me before, but he is one of the most respected scientists I've ever met in my life. So you could have ADHD and it does not interfere with your functioning. Or you can interfere with your function. So a lot of people, it's school performance for kids, right? It's interfering with your, with your life in terms of school performance. But it's more than that. It's, it's sometimes kids getting in trouble, right? With Because they're talking out of turn. And I'll give you examples of all these different things and the way I ask it in the clinic. But they're talking out of turn. They're, they're doing things impulsively and they're getting in trouble. Then you have to think about it. Well, you know, parents are sometimes, well, the teachers have to modify their programs and things like that. And certainly that does have to happen sometimes. Teachers have to have some understanding of it. But we have to think about how sometimes this interferes with kids because the worst thing you could ever do is label a child as being a, quote, bad kid. A bad kid is someone with like an antisocial personality disorder or in children we call it a like conduct disorder or things like that. Those are so rare. Most kids aren't bad like bad kids. That's that's such a uh, – but you'd never want your child to be labeled to that. And remember, even if the teacher is doing the right thing, some kids can be labeled by their peers, right? When well, this person always gets in trouble, I don't want to. A patient of mine with, with ADHD and the family would tell me that they never get invited to birthday parties because all the parents have labeled this kid as a uh, – Bad kid. Or a bad kid. And mm. – and they're like, no, we're not inviting this kid. He causes trouble all the time, gets in trouble all the time. And then you could just picture this kid like staring through the fence, you know, the little holes in the fence, looking at the birthday party happening next door and not invited to it. You know what I mean? And so this is what I remind my patients about, especially the parents, right? Like there are some consequences to not addressing this, diagnosing it, and treating it sometimes, which may not be just scholastic things. Mm-hmm. The things that I, you know, will ask about in clinic for inattention again. Do you daydream? Do they do they stay on task? Do you, you know, does it seem you have to repeat yourself all the time to to them? Uh, can you take out the garbage? Or can you take out? The, you know, you have to keep asking them. Uh, they don't seem to be learning things. It's it's not because they have a poor memory. For memory to work, you need to be attending to what someone's saying. Yeah. That's why, you know, when you get really bad news and then you just start thinking about that, whether it's on the phone or when you're in your doctor's office, you're not paying attention to the rest of it. It's not like your memory is failing, but you need to attend to what's going on. You know, I know we're going to get to the overdiagnosing closer to the end of our discussion here, but man, with Zoom school and virtual school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, all of these things that you're talking about, they're not paying attention. They can't stay on task. I mean, it's got to be a whole new world of that. And you have to be careful, I imagine, to not – anyway, we'll, yeah. we'll talk about I, it later. I've told but all it's in my, my patients, mind. yeah. I've told all my patients, do not make any big judgments about learning During ADHD. Virtual school. Just don't do it. Wait till okay. they're back in school one-on-one -on -one with a teacher again got it, got in it. person. That makes sense. I, yeah, that's a really good point. And so – for hyperactivity, you know, can kids sit still? And so the examples we give is, can they sit still at the dinner table? You know, for their whole time, they have to get up constantly, right? Mm -hmm. Are they constantly, oh, oh spilling, I, I just spilled my uh, my glass, you know, because they're, they're constantly moving. We cannot really diagnose it before four or five. Then those peak and then by seven or eight years, the hyperactive symptoms decline. And maybe it's a bit more inattentive. The inattentive type is more obvious in females. They're not as hyperactive. So hyperactive kids and the impulsive kids come to attention more because they're disruptive to the class, to the house. But the inattentive kids can sometimes just, you know, float by. You don't really see what's going on. And then only when they get older, you realize, okay, they, there actually is a problem here paying attention. So hyperactivity can improve over time, but impulsivity can sometimes stay there over, over time. And so unfortunately, you need to kind of monitor this over time because in adolescence, it can lead to substance abuse, risky sexual behaviors, impaired driving, or things like that. So you need to kind of monitor that over time. So when we look at these patients, what we often do is we do questionnaires, you know, and that can just be done by a pediatrician or family doctor. You don't really need to see a specialist. 
And these questionnaires are sent to the two environments. So the parents will fill one out, for example, and the school will fill one out. And then scoring those questionnaires can see, you know, do you have ADHD and which subtypes might you have based on the questionnaire. Fantastic lay of the land we have here of what it is, what it looks like, how it manifests itself. We know all that, but I'm going to get back to that question of, in my mind, it's what every 35-year-old and up asks, where was this when I was a kid? Was it around? Has it always been around? Or is it all of a sudden on the increase? And if so, I'm going to ask you why. Yeah, so there's many things. One is the fact that we medicalize things more than we used to, you know? So the example I always give people is, Ali, you've seen my handwriting before. Ugh. Ugh. It's really the worst. It's it's even bad for a doctor. Yeah. It's it's no, the it's worst. A, it's a drunken chicken is what it looks like. <laughs> if you gave if you fed a chicken tequila and then put a pen in their mouth and said start writing. First of all, that's pretty good that a chicken can do that. So there's that level of we're impressed. But man, besides that, I don't know what that is. I didn't know if I ever told you this. I almost failed kindergarten because I couldn't tie my shoes. And you've okay. probably, I don't know if you've seen me tie my shoes. I still do bunny ears, honestly. <laughs> you do. Like, it's so, it's I, the uh, most childish <laughs> thing to watch. Yeah. So that's because I have these fine motor kind of difficulties, you okay. know? And if I was a kid now in 2021, I would say, oh, you need to see an occupational therapist. My sister is actually an occupational therapist. Mm. So, you know, maybe, but, well, she would have said that, but she would have also just been three years older than me. So anyway, right. it doesn't matter. It's not too confusing, but <laughs> I would have had to see an occupational therapist do therapy for my difficulty with fine motor skills. I got marked down on my writing through primary school and that was just the way it was, right? And now mm. because I use computers for almost everything, my writing, only the nurse I work with <laughs> at work when she gets to read a prescription or some note I write to her, she you know, goes crazy trying to decipher it. Yeah. She needs to use the Rosetta Stone to kind of like <laughs> figure out what I'm saying. Anyway, so – Part of that is, is over-medicalizing things and needing to do that, right? Which is, I think, one of the points you were trying to make. The other thing is that ADHD is contextual, meaning a child with similar neurodevelopmental traits may be seen as having ADHD or not having ADHD, depending on their social and educational environment. So, for example, in other societies, we know that ADHD is diagnosed mainly in Western societies. In other societies, it's probably because some of those traits are just more tolerated or they're not causing dysfunction in that society, whereas in our society, we are, right? And the concerns about overdiagnosis could be that we've, we're broadening the definition of ADHD because it changes over time. That's, again, why we get into the ADD versus ADHD and things like that because definitions change over time. And there's also overdiagnosis because of societal pressure or parents, again, we talked about during the pandemic are under a lot of stress, but even in general, people are under a lot of stress. And if their kid is having these issues and being disruptive at school, being disruptive at home, they may take them to attention more than in some other cultures where, again, that's that they're more relaxed about some of these things. And there are significant demands being made on school with children standardized tests, you know, being involved in all these activities, pressures and things like that. So maybe it's that school environment and our educational environment, which is also kind of pushing things over. But there's also something with regards to age. And are we just overdiagnosing kids because of age-related issues? So some studies have shown that the youngest children in a class were more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD than the oldest children. Okay, that's been proven in a couple studies. So, for example, there's one study from the Journal of Health Economics where they found that the youngest kids in a cohort of a class, right, because you have kids on the older age range and the younger age range, Mm -hmm. 10% of the youngest children in a kindergarten class were diagnosed with ADHD, whereas only 4.5% of those who were the oldest in the class. Okay, so it just might be a case of those kids getting lost because the the material skews towards the slightly older kids. Exactly, exactly. And then what should just be a normal age development process where, you know, you have to learn a bit when you're younger how to behave and things like that, how to sit still, sit on the carpet during carpet time and things like that. Mm-hmm. They just haven't gotten there yet, but we're falsely diagnosing as ADHD. Studies show it has been overdiagnosed. There's been a consistent increase in ADHD diagnoses between 
1989 and 2017, and an increase in pharmacologic treatment for ADHD between 1971 and 2018. And we're also seeing more and more kids on the milder end of the ADHD spectrum. Again, is that because of age? Is that because of broadening of the diagnostic criteria? But we're definitely seeing that. So yes, I agree with you over time, overdiagnosing has probably occurred. But and there's a very good, again, another systematic review that came out in, in JAMA Network Open that talks about some of these issues. And I know that's a good journal because I had an article come out of that journal three days after this one came of out. Course. So yeah, it's yeah, definitely yeah. a good journal, guys. <laughs> Check out my article. For overdiagnosis to, to be a problem, it has to be causing some harm. But in fact, some people argue that there could be some benefits to overdiagnosis. So some studies show that the diagnosis kind of provides a an explanation for the symptoms people are having and a sense of legitimacy and maybe some more understanding and empathy and sympathy for what's going on and less guilt. You know, I'm not a bad kid, right? Remember, these are kids we're talking about. I'm not a bad kid. I just have this ADHD and, you know, we can look into treating it and then I might improve based on that. There's some studies that find enhanced confidence in these kids, a sense of belonging and enabling kids to have some ownership of their disease and to seek help. But as always, there could be harms as well, right? So some people say it actually decreases a sense of responsibility. They say, well, it's not my fault, ADHD, you know, sorry. You know, mm. I, it's, not, it's not my fault for this going on. There's the labeling, like, is there stigma associated? Uh, could there be prejudice? All oh, these kids diagnosed with ADHD, a teacher says, oh, they're, they're coming to your classroom next year, ADHD diagnosis over here. And maybe it's the opposite. Maybe like, because you're medicalizing them, there uh, have more isolation or exclusion or shame because of that, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe a sense of hopelessness. So I, I can't do anything because you know I have this label of ADHD. So there's probably there's some literature talking about maybe there's some benefits, maybe some literature talking about the harms. You know, we should back up before we go forward, which is with a question. Do, and I'm sure this is in the, you know, I don't know the answer, but I, I bet it's the same unsatisfactory response as you get with a lot of autism and a lot of the cancers. Why does it happen? It's a good point. Yeah, we don't know. It involves the circuitry that goes from the base part of our brain, an area called the basal ganglia, to the front part of the brain. The front part of our brain controls a lot of inhibition and things like that. We don't know why. There's a, there's a genetic component as well, definitely to ADHD, but we don't really know what causes it. Okay. With that in place, what works to help manage it. And, and, and uh, you know, I say manage because I assume it doesn't go away, but maybe it does. I, I don't know. Is there anything? And I want to know, uh, as always, what outside of, you know, medicine helps manage it right, as well as right. medicine. It does improve in a lot of patients over time, not all of them. And maybe that can be another discussion about ADHD in adults. Yeah. But if they're age four or five, so just starting off in like kindergarten, things like that, then usually it's a behavioral treatment. Older kids, we would use medication. So like stimulant medication, plus or minus behavioral therapy as well. So the stimulant medications are things you've heard about, like Ritalin and things like that. There's also longer acting forms of Ritalin. Ritalin is a very short acting stimulant. So we use longer acting ones. And then there's some what we call non-stimulant medication. There are pros and cons to them. Stimulants, the main thing is they cause a lot of insomnia, weight loss. They decrease your appetite. Those are the main uh, risk factors. Some patients are hesitant about it, but it's like I say with everything, you know, is this ADHD interfering with your child's life? If it's interfering with their life, you want to think about looking at treatment. And if it's not, maybe you don't need to do anything, right? So I'm not saying you have to do it, but at least it's worth thinking about if they do. The behavioral treatment is, you know, changing behavior using rewards, reinforcement, timeouts, withdrawing privileges or things like that if, if you're not getting the desired behavior. There's lots of things they say, you know, maintain a schedule, keep distractions to a minimum. Don't tell kids to do five things at once. Uh, go to your room, uh, make your bed, do this, do that, do this. You know, one or two instructions at a time, right? Let them concentrate, accomplish that, move on. There's whole specialists and psychologists who you see just for this, this behavioral treatment for ADHD. What about alternative medicines or, you know, exercise, diet, or right, anything right. else proven to, to help manage it? Yeah. For the people who listen to the podcast who are doctors, you need to ask about this because some studies say as many as 64% of patients with ADHD will be looking at complementary alternative medicine, things other than the stimulant medications, right? 
So things that probably work or would be good is exercise. There are some studies looking at exercise in ADHD, and we know that exercise in general is good, so it's worth looking into. Things that probably don't work, elimination diet, so getting rid of things with food coloring, getting rid of chocolate, getting rid of sugar, that probably doesn't work in terms of the evidence that's out there. A lot of people talk about taking fatty acid supplements like omega-3s. Again, the evidence, there is some evidence out there, but really there's a lot of conflicting studies, so probably it doesn't work that well. Mindfulness, again, there is some suggestion from some studies at work, some that it doesn't. So probably it's better to focus on the other behavioral therapies as opposed to something like mindfulness. I thought there might be some link between sugar. Sugar and hyperactivity yeah. seem to have some links, at least, you know, when I give my kids sugar, we notice they become complete spazzes and, and, and that's been a, a thing. You can see kids bounce off the walls after a, a bag of whatever, Skittles or M&Ms. So I thought the hyperactivity in ADHD might have some link there, but those those studies haven't been done. No, or they have to, been uh, done. Has, in, in yeah, yeah. Not really panned out. So we don't recommend any dietary in interventions. Okay. Interesting. Suspicious, but interested still, I remain. Okay. All right. Well, I should say, uh, Asif, that you know my interest in this subject comes from the fact that I probably have ADHD myself. In fact, I'm quite sure I do. I haven't gone and been diagnosed, but I, you know, when you see those DSM checklists, yeah. you check off eight out of the 10 things. It's, yeah, it's, I've already uh, filled yours out like from like <laughs> since we were eight years old. I've had like a stack. Every year yeah. I fill out one. My ADD is what got Asif interested in becoming a uh, children's doctor potentially. So we actually will have another episode on adult mm -hmm. onset ADHD, specifically because there are so many young adults who, uh, you know, there's been this run on, on Ritalin and Adderall mm -hmm. in, in universities mm -hmm. and an abuse of it, but, but also people who generally say it helps me focus. And so then the question comes up, why aren't you able to focus without it? And yeah, so investigating myself and other adults, uh, that'll be on an upcoming episode this is a great primer for people who want to understand the world of ADHD. And Asif, why don't you let me take the reins on this? Uh, remember that uh, although Asif is a doctor, he is not your doctor. Medical issues we talk about here are for your interest and information. They're not medical advice. Please consult your medical professionals for actual medical advice. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you again soon. Bye. Thank you for that. See ya. See ya.